What's up, guys? Hey, everybody. Hey. What's up? Yeah, we... <laughs> I don't know if you guys want to introduce yourselves, like, real quick. I'm a man. Alex. And, and I'm Russ. And I'm John. I'm Russell. Yeah. yeah okay. And <laughs> welcome back to the Real Dudes podcast, everyone. Uh, this week, we will be talking about traditions in the New Testament. So, yeah. yep, that is what we will be talking about. So, on to the first topic, which I believe is what synagogue. Yeah. Um. Actually, I think uh, first off, we need to kind of like separate. Well, I make something clear. So, uh, often Christians take issue with poor observance uh, based off of certain New Testament passages that actually have to do with extra biblical tradition. And uh, this is like a really big thing that gets tossed around in the Hebrew Roots movement. But uh, can y'all think of like any passages like that that y'all have heard discussed within Hebrew Roots circles? Well, I think like the perfect example is the one where, you know, the, the Pharisees, they ask Yeshua, like, why the disciples don't wash their hands? And why don't they follow the traditions of the elders? So a lot of mm -hmm. people, they read that part, tradition of the elders, and they assume that they're talking about the Torah. When in fact it's talking about an actual added tradition uh, that's not in the Torah, um, and of course it's not wrong to wash your hands, but the problem was that they were making it equivalent to God's own law, and that was the issue. There. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the perfect example. Uh, can anyone else think of any other examples? Um, the only example I can of the moment is when. Um, when you have one of the disciples eating or dining with, with Gentiles, and then whenever, um, whenever rabbis or members of that community come in, then they immediately disavow them and join them, almost like do like an about face. Right. And so yeah. a lot of people kind of take that in different kind of patients and what it's really meant to be. Right. We actually see that also talked about, like that whole idea of Jewsing separately from Gentiles. It's also repeated in the book of Acts, and um, I believe it's Peter that's talking to Cornelius. And uh, this was after he had the dream of the, the, the animals coming down on the sheep. And, uh, and, you know, God showed him that he shouldn't call the Gentiles unclean. But Peter told them, um, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any person common or unclean. And, you know, that kind of stands out to us because it's like, well... The Torah doesn't really say that Jews shouldn't just associate or visit anyone of another nation. Oh, that's kind of taking it a bit far, you know? Yeah, exactly. I mean, really kind of that idea of taking it too far. Uh, at that time, like like that whole passage mentions, they referred to a lot of Gentiles, in, especially the Romans, as dogs, or pigs, mm -hmm. or swine, unclean animals. And even went so far at that time, um, during the rule of uh, those Pharisees that ruled the time, was that even if a Gentile opens a bottle of wine or handles a bottle of wine, you're not allowed to touch it or even interact with it now. It went to that that, that level where you can't even handle goods that was handled by a Gentile in that effort to do maximum separation from the rest of the world. Right. That's actually a practice that's in some circles is still kept today. Yeah. Actually very yes. widely, I think so. Yeah. But I think the main problem is that a lot of people see that uh, mm -hmm. Like Christians, for example, and they automatically assume that that's something that they get from the Torah, like God's law. Right? And, then, and yeah. then they go and they compare, like, oh, see, look, that's why the, the law was done away yeah. with because it wasn't love and things like that, you know. Yeah. But it's just like a yeah, lack of like understanding. Bondage and love. Very restrictive. And then, yeah. So yeah. It gives a bad look. It's, it's bad optics. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I think another example we could talk about is or just mention, is uh, whenever the Pharisees, I believe it was the scribes and Pharisees, accused Yeshua of breaking the Sabbath yeah. uh, because his mm -hmm. disciples were picking grain and, and eating it on the Sabbath out, off, out of the field. And, um, that, and you know, a lot of Christians will point to that passage and say, see, Jesus broke the Sabbath, but he's the Lord of the Sabbath, so he can break it if he wants to, right? Yeah. <laughs> which, which is a weird logic pattern. Yeah. yeah. It's like he keeps it, but so he doesn't strange. keep it. <laughs> He, he's yeah. the king of the thing he does away with. What, what is the point of that? But, <laughs> now that you bring that up, that also reminds me of that. Also, the other time where they accused him of breaking the Sabbath because he healed that man on the Sabbath. 
Yep. Oh, yeah. And a lot of people, they bring up, see, like, look, see, in God's uh, old law, is, it says that you can't heal on the Sabbath. But when you go and you read, it says nothing about that. So right. yeah. there's a disconnection. I feel like, I feel like a, lot, a lot of that is just misunderstanding of the, of the relationship between the preservation of life and what the Sabbath is meant to represent. When you have that kind of disconnect, that crossing your wires, that certain high, that certain um, Pharisees made mm -hmm. during that time, it can be misconstrued as now like anything. If you do anything outside of the synagogue on Sabbath, then it's automatically broken, and it and it gets it starts to spin out of these really weird things. That even even modern day, like you get some rabbi, some some parts of Judaism, that if you walk a certain distance, you're breaking Sabbath, or if you, you think it's like a mouth. It, it, so it's it can definitely go yeah. off in its own its own path all around the means. Right. We actually see that particular tradition in the New Testament. We'll talk about that one today. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Um you know, I think it's important that we bring up all these examples, uh, especially moving into the New uh, New Testament and the, uh, the whole topic of tradition, because uh, we talked about tradition a couple weeks or a few weeks ago, and. Uh, we talked about the value of tradition, right? Like what tradition means for us in our culture, how that can help preserve who we are as a people, how that can help separate us from other peoples, whether that be America and our traditions and our culture, say the nation of Israel and their traditions and cultures. So we, like we've talked about tradition is not necessarily a bad thing in and of itself. Uh, yeah. Perhaps it can be used for bad purposes. But this week we're talking about, we're going to be moving into the realm of Second Temple Judaism, um, Second Temple period Judaism and some of the traditions that uh, arose during this time that started, we start seeing come into play in this time. And I think it's worthwhile talking about how some of these traditions came to, came to be, what, what the environment was that some of these traditions came out of. And so we all got to remember that at this point, we start having Jews come back from the Babylonian exile Um not like a few hundred years before, actually, a um, few, few centuries before. And they come back with this zeal that we want to keep the Torah and we want to preserve the Torah and we want to make sure that we don't go in the way of our ancestors who transgressed against the Torah and who ultimately um, were, those transgressions were the reason that we got sent into exile in the beginning. So they come back with a, part a particular zeal for the Torah and they start, doing certain things like um, whenever there were people um, selling uh, in the marketplaces, I can't remember if it was in or outside of the city. It's in either the book of N Nehemiah or Ezra, but they closed the gates to the city uh, of yeah. Jerusalem to keep people from selling on the Sabbath and to keep yeah. the, the Jews from uh, participating in commerce, um, which, you know, if you got in the habit of keeping that gate closed on the Sabbath to do something like that, you know, you've just started a tradition. And, but, the thing is, is that it's a tradition to help the people uh, guard the Torah and to guard the Sabbath. And so that's actually like pretty good intent behind that. And I could get behind that where I living at that time. Um, and we, so this particular mindset, we want to make sure we don't backslide into the ways of our ancestors and breaking the Torah in certain areas. And people got particularly zealous about it. And we start seeing groups <laughs> like the Pharisees, the Essenes, uh, and the Sadducees as well, different sects that each have their own different traditions. And the Pharisees in particular, um, they held this belief that many of their traditions could be traced back to Moses, or at least they could justify their traditions based on uh, Mosaic authority. That the Torah, the, I mean, the Pharisees were most likely some of the literate people. Not everyone was at this point. They could read the Torah, they could interpret things, and they had probably had traditions that were passed down for the past several generations, at least from the return from exile that they had started doing as a way of keeping the commandments. And, um, and so some of these start getting a little too rigorous though. And so we actually see where Yeshua has an issue with certain traditions in the new Testament. Um, some of which we were just talking about, yeah. but, yeah. but on the other hand, we see where Yeshua and others actually kept certain traditions in the first century. And so it's not necessarily, you can't just say traditions are bad. Yeah. It's kind of like a case-by-case -case basis. Perhaps what's the intent behind them? How are you How are you using them? Are you using them to praise God and do better or to beat people over the head? So 
Uh, what are some traditions that you all like can like point out from the New Testament that like say Yeshua kept like anything that stands out to you? Synagogue. Yeah, synagogue is a great tradition, right? You mean get a bar mitzvah? an age. I didn't have one. Didn't have one. I was in. I was in. in. Well, he again, like he, he, he followed the, the law of the day. Mm -hmm. right? He he was he was a Jew, so he followed almost any the custom. Weird is a lot of the a lot of the custom traditions we see today. I'm sure he participated in not all of them, obviously, but I'm sure there were some key ones he that he participated in back in his day. But mm -hmm. um, so, going, I mean, he was. No, I was gonna say, but going back to the synagogue because it shows that you know he would go to the seat of Moses, which was you know. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I may be off a little bit, but that's where the you know the person that would go and read the Torah portion uh, of that week, he would go and read at the seat of Moses. And you want to say something? So we actually don't know what went on in the seat of Moses. Oh, okay. It, so something that we do see in the New Testament, and it might not have been like this in every synagogue, but whenever you went to go up to read from a scroll, you were actually standing while you were reading. So it's possible that they weren't sitting in the seat of Moses. And by the way, like the tradition of standing while you read is actually still kept in the synagogue today. Yeah, I've seen so, it is. Yeah. So it's possible that they read from the Torah in the seat of Moses, but it's also just as possible that like a leader of the congregation may have taught sitting the, in the seat yeah. of Moses. Okay. So you want to say Do you know exactly why they stand while they read? Um I actually I can't answer that. I don't know. It's a, yeah. Uh, well, um, this would be me speculating. Knows? Knows? It'd be me speculating, yeah, but like um, out of like reverence, respect, because it's the words from the king. Yeah. So you stand yeah. up. Okay. I think because we sense. do that when we do the the prayers for the feast, we all stand up uh, because you know it's like reading the words from the king. So you would stand up out of respect. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Uh, with the yeah, standing, yeah. even taking the three steps forward, and once you're done praying, taking the three steps back to show that I'm entering this state of holiness and entering this level of respect, and then I'm, you know, receding back from the presence of the king to then enter back into the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the common world. That's, That's funny, right, yeah. So, Which is a, good, like that. And, is a good mindset yeah. to have, you know, to think exactly. about. Yeah. It's, it's always um, in the temple. Like, even, even to this day in, in Israel, like, uh, if you go to the wall, and then there's, there's the tunnel, um, beneath where you can walk above the street that's, that's still uh, adjacent to the wall and they have all these books and, and everything and you see rabbis still in there standing towards the wall and praying with you know with, with, with the tools mm -hmm. of Kamash and everything so you even still see it today and to even go further there's still a tradition that i saw in in uh in jerusalem where on sabbath eve you'd have rabbis go out and with with megaphones or horns just start telling people, okay, it's time to start shutting down, and everyone, mm -hmm. all the marketplaces in the city would just start closing down. Yeah, it's very cool. All at the same time, and so you see that even, even today, like they want to make sure that nobody is going to be punished or break break the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So at a certain time, we all go out, we just start announcing, shut it everything down, shut it all down. It was it was pretty. It was actually really interesting to see that. It's really good to see. Yeah, that's really cool. But yeah, like um, but the fact that you can't find the seat of Moses and the synagogues in the Torah, you know, shows that it's a, uh, in a sense, a tradition, and Yeshua was keeping it. Oh, yeah. So he didn't have a problem with right. it, you know. You see it many times at the synagogue. Yeah, and also, right, so, so to be, yeah. Here, go ahead, sorry. Sorry. Um, uh, for Yeshua to be certified, like, for him to be a rabbi, right, because he was a rabbi, what certain things was he supposed to not only study and learn so he can be legitimized as a teacher to stand in the synagogue to teach because it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't only the torah it's self only right um that's actually a really good question i'm not sure if there was a I mean, particular curriculum yeah. back then that you I, had to know i think I think at the time, if, if, if we're going to gauge it based off what it takes to be a scholar, like Paul knew the entire Torah back and forth, he could recite it. It may have just been he had to have known the entire Torah and maybe have some sort of reference to rabbis during Babylonian exile. Cause yeah. I'm, I'm sure they also had books about that and everything and commentaries and that. So if there was going to be any kind of curriculum, it may, it may have folded some of that in. But I'm pretty sure the there was like a, I'm pretty sure there was like a standard. Not yeah. just anybody can go and yeah. read 
Sure, there is some people to, to listen to this. Someone is going crazy. Yep, somebody, somebody in the comments is going crazy. Out about this. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me if there was a, a host of extra biblical literature that it, people would have at least been familiar with back then, because something we see in the Second Temple period is like this explosion of literature, right? This yeah. uh, that's not necessarily the Bible. Whereas, I mean, like the Bible is a sacred. The scrolls of the Bible would have been a sacred text. Scrolls of the Tanakh, um, that obviously would have been like a, a staple. People would have understood these are holy books. But we also see uh, books in the intertestamental period, within the Second Temple period, uh, broadly, uh, just more literature, things like the books of Enoch being written, of Jubilees, things that we might say are part of, they, were, they might have been part of like the Jewish home library, but books that people didn't necessarily uh, equate with Scripture. But they were still familiar with a lot of these things, and I knew what they were. And um, and I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if someone was going to be uh, maybe like a big teacher. They had to know like the Tanakh back and forth. But they probably had to have been acquainted with certain traditions that were kept in the community. And perhaps with some of these extra writings as well, if, if that's what people, um, that's what, you know, the audience at large they would have been able to relate to these things. It might make sense if you knew these books as well, if you want to perhaps sometimes um, settle like commonality or understand where your audience is, know how to speak to them. Uh, that's just like, yeah. like throwing a guess out there. I, I don't know for sure though. I mean, a lot of that really comes down to the most important things about traditions, what they are, and that's not context. I'm sure mm -hmm. teaching back then required a lot of context and contextual knowledge of the community of the, of the nation at large, because anyone living in that community would have also had knowledge of what's happening in the nation. And, you know, so you had to really kind of be well-rounded, I'm sure, to be a teacher back then. And that goes even till now. So just even even kind of that in itself is a tradition we can equate with, with the Messiah, just trying to be well-rounded, knowing the Torah, knowing these traditions and kind of knowing what to parse out, which is kind of what he was trying to do, mm -hmm. was seeing what was there and parsing out what was important one really wasn't you see that's why oh, it, um, no. well sorry no go, no go ahead please please no, i was gonna say that's why it doesn't make sense to me when people say that you know he tried to do away with traditions because obviously mm -hmm. you can see that he grew up following these traditions so it would make sense that he would follow them and then just in a sneaky you know, kind of way like just do do away with it though. what was uh -huh. it i feel like a lot of that's like a translation issue yeah yeah but anyway Russell, you got super like I saw the like, in your eye. Was yeah, yeah, your eyebrows. So, in the uh, in the first century, uh, in the second mm -hmm. temple period, the Galilee was actually very rigorous on ritual purity. Uh, mm -hmm. We actually find several stone quarries throughout the region of the Galilee, which were used to make stone like chalk stone vessels uh, for ritual purity, because within second temple period purity ritual stone vessels could not contract ritual impurity and so this was like a big thing to have like stone vessels because you know like if it's something made of clay and some, like say something dies on it that's unclean then you have yeah. to smash the vessel but if it's made of stone then it won't contract the impurity and so it's kind of like you know you've got like the you've got the invincible vessels or something like that like at least whenever it came to ritual impurity i believe it was just, it was stone and glass uh, by tradition, they could not contract ritual impurity. They're not. Well, I don't know why stone exactly. Wasn't but, it also um, go ahead. or uh, metal? Yeah, well, with metal, I think if you could scour certain, it. Certain metals. There were certain metals in the temple that were considered very, very richly pure because they couldn't also. They also couldn't contract impurity. Okay, with with metals, I know I don't know about perhaps certain specific metals you're referring to, but with metal in general, you could actually scour it or burn it, and you could essentially refine it, like uh, you could cleanse it of impurity. Whereas like things like a uh, like clay, I know for sure, uh, pottery, uh, maybe with wood, you you couldn't ritually cleanse them. I'm not sure about wood. Yeah. The main reason, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up death, because a lot of the main reason for that that people wonder is if you have like like a clay pot and someone dies on top of the clay pot, the clay pot is very porous. It's a porous material. Mm -hmm. It's also, it, it, it does allow some moisture in, so it will get more get that impurity. We get that weird death juices, I guess is what we call it now. <laughs> so you, you really can't, 
you can't use it anymore. Whereas if it's stone, it's like water and moisture isn't going to penetrate in. Mm -hmm. If it's metal, yeah, it's, it's going to right penetrate over. in. You can scour it, you can clean it, and it's going to be fine. As opposed to pottery, which you have to smash and get rid of because now it's not chance to use it. So there are there are logical reasons why you have this. People don't equate logic with the Bible as much as they should. They just take it a fixed value. It's like, oh, this is just a holy thing. But they don't really wonder mm -hmm. kind of on why it would be holy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one, did you want to follow up on that? Sorry, was I interrupting someone? No, 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 there you go. So, um, talking about like these vessels that could or could not contract ritual impurity and stone specifically, mm -hmm. um, whenever we talk about the first miracle of Yeshua at the marriage or the wedding at Cana, yeah, um, we actually, you know, where we see Yeshua turn water into wine, uh, he actually commanded the, the, the servants at the at the wedding to take the stone jars, which were used for uh, ablutions, for ritual or for ritual purity uh, rites. That I can't remember which gospel. If it might have been a couple that mentioned this specifically, if someone could find that. But it does mention that he they took the the jars which were used for ritual purposes and they filled that with the water and then he turned that water into wine. But the thing is, is that if they were using these um, these jars would have been made of probably chalk stone like that. It mentions that they were used for ritual purity purposes. Mm -hmm. And it's just interesting that it brings that up. Like they, that they were these jars which were used for purity purposes. And I heard someone once uh, within the uh, Hebrew root circle say, well, yeah, Yeshua was sticking it to the, those traditions. He was saying, ha, look at, <laughs> like, look at your, your ritual purity jars. And I turned that into wine. That's like, kind of like, you know, in your face. But, you know, I, I read that and I'm thinking like, oh, wow, he turned ritually pure water into clean, wonderful, like the best wine, you know? Because yeah, they drank yeah. out of it. Yeah. So like, <laughs> like, wasn't, it wasn't like wine. Wine wasn't an impure thing back then anyway. I don't know what. It wasn't yeah, like, like that was. <laughs> it wasn't a sin to be around wine. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it's not like he turned water into urine or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 like he turned this the water into <laughs> it's like he turned this ritually pure water and the gospels are clear to tell us that into the best wine at the event you know and it's kind of just like that play on uh second temple period traditions like the the audience would have known that it's like wow clean water pure water into wine i don't know i just makes me wonder how they would have taken that in the first century it's pretty interesting i didn't know yeah, about that. Um, it's pretty cool it's John uh, chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. Um, at least the version I'm reading it out of just says, um, Yeshua said to his servants, fill the uh, said to his servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby sits six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews, by the Jews, by the Jews for <laughs> ceremonial washing. Okay, or yeah. Ceremonial washing or, or for mikvah in this case. Um, you know, to to repurify things. Um, each, hold, each holding from 20 30 gallons yeah that's a lot of wine. i was that's studying abroad at the <laughs> university of haifa and they have this Ooh. museum on campus called the hecht museum so like, it's really worthwhile mm -hmm. going to if anyone's ever uh, in israel uh, just wants to go to a museum for the day and they actually had some of these jars there yeah um mm -hmm. like on display and uh i was thinking like man those guys that were lifting those jars they had to have been like like yeah. Ripped, shredded, like are they huge? Like big they're, 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 the pretty, yeah. <laughs> they're large and they're just made of stone. Like these, that makes sense. And that filled they with made like so thirty much. gallons of liquid. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, you see, when I was a kid, I used to picture it as like a small, like, like vase yeah, jar, like a little clay pot. Yeah, I was like, how do you for all those people at the party? <laughs> no, now I it makes sense. Right, <laughs> and I'll do it again. <laughs> did um did the verse say if it was stone jars specifically that they I were using? I think he said stone jars. Yeah. Okay, six stone jars used by the Jew. Okay, by the Jews. Yeah. Jews. yeah. Ceremony yeah. washing. <laughs> you reading from the King James version, man? Uh, I think it was the New International Version that I, uh, I pulled up real quick. It was, it was like a quick search, and it just found the exact verse and check. Yeah. yeah. Well, like what they translated as Jews, they also translated yeah. Judeans. What did Judeans use for ceremonial washings? From the King James Version. Second job. Hmm. Yeah. But it's just cool, you know, like 
it's one of those things that we can actually verify with archaeology that people were using these stone vessels for ritual purity purposes, especially in the Galilee. And then we see Yeshua at a wedding in the Galilee, just like the whole yeah. thing kind of comes together, you know? Don't mind me. I'm Sorry. just going to go through the, the, the right. New King James and, and decipher it because there's a lot of it's a lot of old we're old the old English terminology here. And now I beseech the lady not to grab it, the jarth. <laughs> grab it thine jar grab it thine and converge it into wine. Who who's ever transgresseth grant transgresseth? That's a really tra transgressive. Five syllables. They love they love the and, and all the transgressive. Yeah, they love that. They're like Mike Tyson. Everything. Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson. It's, a, it's a Mike King James wants to put the Mike Tyson on his day. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. But um, but besides mm -hmm. those traditions, like there was other traditions that he did, right? That he kept. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, oh, of course. He kind of goes really well. I mean, yeah. There's that portion where he goes. Uh, was it during the festival? Uh, I think. So. How does it describe the festival of lights? Dedication. The dedication. Yeah. Hanukkah. Dedication. And a lot of people who wouldn't know that that means Hanukkah would just read that like, oh, okay, whatever. But the fact that it's Hanukkah and Hanukkah, you know, cool. Hanukkah is not, right uh, it's not in the Torah to keep Hanukkah. Hanukkah was added. You know, it's kind of like a Memorial Day yeah. Yeah. type of thing. The it's, fact it's, that, actually, Hanukkah is like the best example of a tradition that mm -hmm. was really adopted mm -hmm. and brought in. And all, it was, it's almost canonized. It's pretty that, much. It's pretty much. Just yeah. before you get, yeah. In the mind of the people, that's really what it was. Yeah. Confirmed yeah. another one. Yeah. And if anyone wants to like point at Hanukkah and be like, "Oh, well, how can they do that?" Well, you know, just look at the Book of Esther. Huh? Well, they did that with Purim. You know. Exactly. Yeah. And, and like, no one's making a big deal, being like, "Oh, how dare you give us a holday to celebrate?" Like, how <laughs> how dare you? <laughs> how dare you make this wonderful day? More celebration. <laughs> How dare we celebrate a deliverance from our enemies? Yeah, it doesn't make it. Because for me, Hanukkah is kind of like the 4th of July, like Jewish version. You know what I mean? Like, cause it's like a kind of remembrance of what happened and kind of like a look forward of what is to come, you know? Oh, yeah. And it's so cool because it's all about the temple. Yeah, it's like, a lot of it has to do with the temple um, and the rededication of it. I'm down with the temple. Yeah, isn't it the rededication of the altar? But the problem is that a lot of people, they have this negative view of the temple. So, you know, they have this negative view of the temple. Anything linked with the temple is also going to be negative. So for a lot of people, Hanukkah is just uh, like a waste of time because why waste your time with something negative in their perspective? You know? um, I, mean, I, I got like a funny story about Hanukkah, just like while we're talking about traditions in general, you know, like today it's like, because there's this tradition of the miracle of the oil associated with Hanukkah. Yeah. That like mm -hmm. the, the oil lasted for eight days. Way longer than yeah. 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 Uh, and so people eat like oily food today, like, like yeah. latkes and other goodies. And so there's this one time my younger brother was actually, he was in Sunday school and this was after we'd started uh, pursuing uh, like more Torah observance in our lives. And we, we were celebrating Hanukkah too. We enjoyed it. And my younger brother mentioned in a Sunday school class, he's like, oh, my family keeps Hanukkah. And they're like, well, Hanukkah is not a good holiday to keep because you eat greasy food and that's not good for your temple. That's not good for the body of your temple. And I'm just like, okay, well, then don't go to Like, excuse me, ma'am. Shut up and eat. Like, excuse me, eat fast food? Okay, well, then sit down, please. If you can. You live in the South. <laughs> You live in the South. Exactly. Yeah, you guys are in Alabama. How do you tell somebody that? Here. Bro, I don't, <laughs> I don't even know. Yeah. It's funny because the like every morning. Is surrounded by the grease. <laughs> it's funny because like every is. morning uh, before we would go to Sunday school, like they would have donuts donuts there for us to like exactly. eat and snack on, donuts and coffee. Wow. Like, how do you think those donuts are made? Like... <laughs> That'd be the funniest thing you eat a donut. Happy Hanukkah. <laughs> what? But Hanukkah is like it's another so great example of a tradition. Yeah, because there's not there's nothing wrong with it, and if you think of it, it kind of adds in a good way, you know, to to think about the rededication of the temple. That's what mm -hmm. it's about. The whole mm -hmm. story. And well, like, it, another really important thing that it adds, and no one, and this goes for all people. People don't talk about it, is it gives you an identity. 
Hmm? If you if if you are grafted in, children of Israel, whether whether you can trace your lineage or not, if you're grafted in, you're you're one of us. You're in. You're in the tribe. You're part of the nation. Now we have these traditions. We have these. We have these events. We have these holidays. Now you can participate in, and now you feel that you have you have a you have a history. You have a culture. You have your sins, and that brings a sense of community, and that brings a sense of like honor, and, and, yeah. and like, it brings good good vibes. And that's people don't ever associate the, the good vibes with that. And that's that's to me is a it's a big missed opportunity by a lot of, a lot of people. Out there. Yeah, you know, honestly, if there's any extra biblical holiday, like us about like Torah and everything, that I would want to keep, like, honestly, if it we're between Purim and Hanukkah for me, you know, I think I really love the message of Hanukkah and that it's yeah. like these people are like, give us our temple back, give us our Torah back, like we like we're zealous to keep the Torah, like you're not gonna tell us that we can't keep the Torah on our land, mm -hmm. uh, you're not gonna tell us that we can't sacrifice to our God and our temple. It's like, how dare you come into our home and tell us what we can and can't do with the covenant that our God gave us? You know, it's like, I can get behind that message, bro. You know, it's, it's yeah, like an it's awesome message. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But, like, um, I, I was like, I wish everyone kind of like took that message to heart and just got zealous for the Torah, like every every winter, you know? <laughs> but only in the winter. Oh, that doesn't yeah. Why not? <laughs> well, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> well, those eight days. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a scholar of those eight days. I'm a, I'm a, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but all year ideally. <laughs> but uh, I mean, besides Hanukkah, there is also like other traditions that you should have kept, like Passover, for example. There are traditions that you yeah. kept, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's actually um, if we look at the New Testament, uh, the the Synoptic Gospels, especially, it's very that being Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, it's very clear that Yeshua's last supper with his disciples was a Passover Seder. Very, very clear based off of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John kind of hints at it, but John kind of has his own, like he's not so much focused on like what meal it actually was, but it was more focused on like what was Yeshua saying during the meal mm -hmm. in John. But it's very clear throughout the Synoptic Gospels that like Yeshua's last supper was a Passover Seder. And like in that meal, we see all of these staple things going on that were like these staple things that you would have done at a Passover Seder at this time. That are nope. uh, that, that we still yeah. do. In a lot of yeah. Years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so one of them, it talks about him. Um, they were reclining. That was one thing. And I think it mentions him reclining at another meal in the New Testament, but that it mentioned that it was Passover and that he was reclining is actually like a really important thing for Passover in the Second Temple period because reclining was uh, something that the aristocracy did. Uh, it's like, you know, you might recline at like a triclinium couch or something like that. It's kind of this, uh, oh, goodness, like a couch kind of like got three sides that go around like a center table. And so you would recline like a booth, on your kind of? side. Kind, kind of, yeah, kind of think like oh, a bench booth type okay. of thing. Is it that, that yeah. like, piece of furniture that a lot of people like associate with like Roman decadence? You have that guy kind of leaning yeah. on your thing. It's so it's like ah oh, okay, so like yeah, like, in the grapes. It's it's like it's that that's the furniture. Yeah, yeah, kind of something like that. And so they would okay. have been centered around, like they all would have been leaning down in mm -hmm. uh in a way. There could have been different ways they were leaning. But they all would have been around like a center table while they were kind of like leaning, like they were laying down on their sides is what they would have been doing. And uh, and then picking the food off the table. And so if you actually have a Seder plate today at your Passover Seder, this actually comes from the actual tape, like the big center table piece that um, would have had all those elements on it originally. And now it's kind of just kept as like a little a remembrance of it. And what's the, what's the point of reclining though? So it's like you're mimicking the aristocracy. We are free men at Passover, right? Exactly. We're free. We're liberated. Um, yeah. We're no longer slaves. You can, you can tie in the, yeah. the, the meaning of reclining with the, with the same meaning as the as diseases. Right? The idea of, of the, the task of the corner of clothing was only for high priests, mm -hmm. was for those above you in status, in the same reclining. It was, it's not meant for the common folk. It's meant for the high up. Like the aristocracy, like you said, it's for the upper class. You you can't do this. You're too yeah, busy like, yep. farming your turnips. You can't you can't recline. You can't do that. But in God's kingdom, you are free men. You are you are you know, you're able to indulge in these things because you know you're you're not a slave. You're not, you're not beneath anybody. 
That's really good. Thank you. Yeah. That was really good, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, something else that we see at the, his Passover seders, we see multiple references to wine and uh, to breaking bread throughout the meal. Yeah. And you know, at the Passover seder, it was most likely that they had multiple cups of wine. Uh, they would have been breaking bread throughout the meal um, mm -hmm. as part of the ritual, breaking it at certain points, at least today in today's Passover Seder, which dates back at least like 1800 years, most likely. Yeah. Um, and it's very possible that these same traditions were being kept in Yeshua's day, that they broke bread at certain points in the meal. Um, they drank multiple cups of wine, different points in the meal, throughout the meal, drank cups of wine throughout it. And... Um, what else? Oh, you know, uh, I think there's actually like, I got this, I learned this from Ryan White, but he made this really good point that in the Passover Seder, especially today, it's very common to explain the traditions, uh, like yeah. explain like, well, it's, you know, it, it even goes all the way back to the Torah where the kid asks, like, he's going to ask, what is all of this? Like, what does this mean? Yeah. And mm -hmm. so the dad takes that opportunity to explain what all of this meal is about and how it takes back to the exodus in Egypt and how the different things are going to symbolize that liberation from Egypt. And what does the Passover lamb mean? And what is, what do these bitter herbs mean in the matzah? Why is it that on this night of all other nights, we only eat unleavened bread and not leavened bread. And so this whole tradition of explaining everything was like a, a big part of the culture and Yeshua participates in that tradition, but he does it in such a way that he explains the meal in terms of and the the death like his death and resurrection and saying like if you uh, eat of the bread you're eating in my body and you drink the wine you're drinking my blood and you're going to participate in that sacrifice that he was about to perform on behalf of humanity mm -hmm. so, so to speak right you're that you were more from the physical meaning than, than the average yeah yeah. But it's like, in terms of tradition, he's, he's participating in the tradition to explain the meal, not just in terms of the, the lamb of the original Exodus, but this newer Exodus, this liberation that he was going to do through right. his, his the greater Exodus. Life. The greater yeah. Exodus, yeah. 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 So. It's okay. really cool. Yeah. I've done a lot. But, uh, see, that's why I think people need to look into... Like, instead of just reading straightforward the Bible like a newspaper, like, I think you have to, like, examine, uh, like, what are those things that, that they talk about specifically? Like, um, yeah. I think at one point, I think in, I think it's in Acts, there's a Sabbath day journey. I know, Russell, you were mm -hmm. talking about that one at one point. Yeah. But, uh, Actually, let me, let me pull, look at, pull that up, that way we... We yeah, we read it. Yeah. In the text. Okay. Uh, before we get into that, there's like a, like at least like one more thing in uh, Matthew. Uh, at least at least one more thing in the Passover Seder that's like a very much a tradition. Yeah. And that's like at the end of the meal, how they like they sang a hymn and then they went out. Uh, yeah. at the Last supper. It's like that singing a hymn. They were most likely singing from the Psalms, which was like another thing you do like at the end of the Passover Seder and and sure tradition. Yep. Yeah. So that was probably what they were singing. They were singing the psalm, yeah. part of the Passover tradition. I, yeah, oh, actually, you know, also, Johnny, to, to touch on what you said, Johnny, yeah, people, a lot of people just read read the text just as text, and they read it at face value. They don't, they don't bother to put the pieces together and kind of fill the web out and see, okay, so they're, so they're having this meal, which really is this tradition that equates to this, but he's explaining it to explain this other message but it, but they're still fulfilling this tradition, which dates back to this story back here, which involves these people, which still connects to this system. Once you start opening your mind up to the idea that it's all interconnected in some way, that all the little things that you thought really meant nothing, you know, like, oh, like the order of which Yeshua talks about the things that he does during the meal, it all has a meaning in and of itself. And, so yeah. it, and when you go through each meaning like that, now it starts to cut the dots and fill out and flush out that whole world that you're reading. So it's not just text anymore. It's really... It's more of like a real account. I mean, what really helps out oh. is um, keeping the cedar. Because if you didn't keep the cedar, yep. you wouldn't be able to see the similarities. Like you said, Russell, at the end of the cedar, we start singing you know, some solemns. Um, but you wouldn't see the connection if you didn't keep the cedar. Because some other people are just going, oh, you know, they just sang some random hymns, whatever. 
you're not going to see the connection. Um, and I think that's the problem, is that a lot of people try to apply what they read in the Bible to their culture. When, yeah, you know, right. there's, a, there's a different culture back then, and it's a different audience. No way. Can't do it. So you got all farmers. You're, you're not going to understand it. Exactly. Yeah. And honestly, like, from wow. personal experience, I found that keeping a lot of, like, participating in a lot of traditions that the Jewish people have maintained throughout the millennia, mm -hmm. I, I, I found that it, I, I feel like I can relate to Yeshua in another way, because, you know, you're partic yeah. participating in the, the customs that, you know, his people and the descendants of his people uh, in his day that they're still keeping today. And they've preserved a lot of these traditions. There have been some new ones along the way, but you know, um, some people have this negative attitude towards tradition. So it's like, well, tradition's inherently bad, but, and like, like we want to point at a lot of Christian traditions. We want to say like, oh, they could come from foreign influence from paganism or something like that. But the thing is like, most of the traditions of the Jewish people are rooted in the Torah. And uh, yeah. a lot of them go back to Yeshua's day. It's kind of cool. You know, it's like, oh, like I'm keeping, I'm, as much as I'm an American, I can participate in the, the ancient customs of the people of Israel and exactly, kind yeah. Of, yeah, relate to God's people and like another yeah. level that way. It helps you identify with the creator. Like, Oh, his, his son did the same things I'm doing. Oh, cool. I, I have that connection. I have that identity now and help yeah. kind of bridge that gap. But, um, Oh, it's a lesson of thought. I think you're going to say something, right? Oh yeah. Kind of going to where you, you and Jonathan went, where it's yeah. like, one of the things we have to kind of put in in, in, in our habit is well, the, we we're not we're the intended. The Bible was written for us. The scripture was written for us, but we're not the intended audience. Mm -hmm. So those things were like culture changes, uh, translation changes, and all these different things. Where when we read this and we just take it, like you said, at face value, mm -hmm. we just give it a literal version of what the Bible is. It's going to be a whole twisted version of what it's meant to be. So we got to kind of get used to the point where it's like, well, we need to study. What, how did they think back then? Because mm -hmm. obviously things change. It's one of those things where the, the, the Torah was meant for everybody to understand at that time. Now yeah. some of those things just don't make sense to us. It doesn't quite apply. So it's yeah. kind of like they have different slang, they have different words. They didn't say things like it's lit. So <laughs> we, we Wait, have to. Are you, have tell, to are you telling me that they didn't dab at all back then? They had no dabbing back then? <laughs> <laughs> You see, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because you actually that helped kind of refocus what I was going to say. And that's a lot of traditions that people condemn as being paganism and that, oh, a lot of things that Jews do is rooted in paganism. And so, not, no, it's not, again, like you said, it was written to a people of a certain culture of a certain time of a certain, you know, kind of agricultural stance and status. They understood these things. They understood them in a different way than we do. They didn't see it as paganism and they saw it as... You have to think like when 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 we, when they were slaves in Egypt, they saw the they saw the gods, they saw the pantheon. So when you had the when you had the father and Yahweh come in and essentially kill the gods one, one at a time, like okay, cool. Now we know there is no pantheon. There's only one God, Yahweh Hu Elohim. Let's go. Now yeah. we we wouldn't get that. We we don't we don't understand that because we don't we don't believe in a in a you know a big pantheon of different gods that have different things and are some yeah. are for the same thing but they're named different. It's weird. I don't know. Whatever. Egyptians are weird. <laughs> anyway, so, but, um, like, where, where, where are we going with this? I think it was the Sabbath journeys where we're going with this. We're going to start That's reading right. Acts 1, but we just wanted to add something oh, yeah. towards the, yeah, the Passover stuff. Uh, I've, I've got it here if you want to. Is it Acts one twelve? Yeah, Acts one yeah. twelve. Read uh, just, just verse 12? Yeah, just verse 12. Yeah. So, uh, then they returned to Yerushalayim from the mount called uh, Olivet, which is near Yerushalayim, a Sabbath day journey away. So, like, normal people that are going to read that and be like, okay, what is that? What does that mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> is that just, like, the day? They took the whole, the whole day to get there? The whole yeah, can you, <laughs> 24 hours? <laughs> can, can, you, uh, can you explain that, Russell? Yeah, so, for, like, for those of you who are not familiar with, like, say, the, the geography, uh, the layout, mm -hmm. topogra topographical layout of Jerusalem, kind of little area. Um, like the, the province of Jerusalem? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, like, you have the city of Jerusalem, and then you have the, um, I believe it's the the Kidron uh, Valley. Yeah, on mm -hmm. the yeah. oh goodness, on the eastern side of Jerusalem, 
and then on yeah, the it, other it's east, side, it's of, east of the temple between the between the temple itself and the Mount of Olives. Right yeah, exactly. That Valley. Yeah. So, so you've got like Mount of Olives, Jerusalem, and a Kidron Valley in between, and it's, it's, it's a pretty steep mm-hmm. valley. But but it's yeah, it but the Mount of Olives is pretty close to Jerusalem, all things considered. Mm-hmm. You know, it might have been like, like a between the trek. Two, no. Yeah, they, they would have yeah. had a bridge in between the two, and it was probably like a significant trek, just you know, walking down the mountain, like probably was like you would have you would have broke a sweat but but they're cr- relatively close in proximity to one another um and so the sabbath day journey whenever it's saying that like that was a sabbath day jo- journey from jerusalem like they're they're pretty close to one another uh they had a way of factoring like an exact distance uh i can't remember exactly what that distance was but they had a way of factoring like of putting like a number to a distance away from like a city or inhabited areas mm-hmm. uh, and how far you could travel on a Sabbath day. And, and so, and the thing is, is like, once you start, you get out of the city, out of the inhabited area, and then you start walking, like you have so it's basically you have so much of a distance you can walk within the allowed walking distance on a Sabbath based off of this tradition. Right. But that we see this being mentioned in the book of Acts as a system of measurement um, that, and it just kind of throws it out there. Luke just th- throws it out there in the book of Acts. He's it was like, it was a Sabbath day journey. He's expecting that his audience would know that what he's talking about. He wouldn't just be like, it was a Sabbath day journey. And everyone's just like, Oh yes, I have no idea. Yeah. What that is. Yeah. We don't have, no one needs to go over that. We got, we got that right. Okay. <laughs> and so, uh, so Luke obviously intended, like he knew that his audience would know what he's talking about. Alex, we can hear you. <laughs> what? Yeah, when you do that with so your loud, butt. Bro. It, 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 oh, my bad. Sorry. <laughs> Are you good? Uh, like, whenever Luke just puts it out there, he assumes his audience knows what he's talking about. And that's probably because so much of his audience might, many people in his audience may have kept that tradition, or they at least would have been aware of it. And so, you know, this whole Sabbath day journey, how far you can travel on the Sabbath. That might have been something that some of the early followers of Yeshua kept. Um, and, you know, you got to think that traveling long distances back then was not the easiest thing. You got to saddle up your animal or you might just need to start walking. Uh, you could run into all kinds of trouble just walking on the road. You want your animal to rest on the Sabbath as well. And um, and it could be a pretty tiring thing traveling between cities back then. Yeah. Like you might need to prepare for the journey and you're probably carrying a lot on your back while you're doing it. And so um, you know, and What's that's family not, too. Oh yeah, yeah. And no, you know, no, I'm no. not saying any of this to just to basically like slap on anyone on the hand that well, drives well, their car well, to the to their um the congregation on Shabbat. Yeah. You know, we live in different circumstances today. We don't all live within walking distance usually yeah. of our our congregation. But back then it was a very different story. People probably lived within very close proximity to where they would have been meeting with people on Shabbat, mm-hmm. or at least around the temple if we're in Jerusalem, right? So, yeah. Uh, I think you're Daniel. Yeah, really, yeah. really quick, I while, while you were explaining, I was just watching around different versions on, on the Bible app and figuring out if one of them had at least an idea of close to proximity. And in the New International Version, it says a Sabbath day's walk was about five uh, five eighths of a mile. Or about one kilometer. Mm. I, oh, actually, I'm glad you went into that because I was doing some research and I saw from a couple, few different sources it was roughly 2,000 cubits. Okay. Yeah, so they measured about 2,000 cubits and that's your limit. If you go any further, you, you got to get stoned. You're done. So, so <laughs> stay in that, you're good. Don't 2001. Be on that, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> you see like this, this, like this red barrier kind of pop up like this. Yeah, this, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like the big Fortnite firewall just comes up. But, um, <laughs> you, you, yeah, the, the old village waiting there. Like I'm waiting for. Yeah, Give me a reason. Every step they take, Give they me a reason. Push their hand for the back. <laughs> <laughs> but I, a reason. I think Queen. it's. I think it's pretty interesting though because, like, like you said, Russell, he wrote it because the audience that he was writing to knew mm-hmm. about it. It was something that everybody yeah. did at the time, and if everybody's doing it, including you know Yeshua himself, um. Uh, where's it going with this? Well, it shows you that you know it's a tradition that it's not. Yeah, if everyone's doing not, that, it it's not bad, cool, right? Yeah, it's nothing crazy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
I mean, that's 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 really that's, that's really the idea of it, right? Like, you you, you want to have these good traditions that everyone can participate in, and, you know. And if Yeshua himself is doing it, I guess that's the seal of approval. I think right. that's always that's really always the biggest thing that like if he does if he did it and he told us to follow yeah. in his ways, then there's there's no reason not to. Reason not to do like, it. I'm not sure about that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what you saying is, when I was younger, I didn't understand it. I just kind of looked at it. And it's like it's not like Dave's walk. Oh, that's far. Okay, uh, perfect. Let's go back to Psalms 150. Let's push it back. Yeah, <laughs> I get that one. <laughs> Got it. Journey, cool. Anyway, journey. Yeah. <laughs> cool. No, I think a lot of people you know, the, they just read it and they overlook it and they just keep reading. Because I don't it's know. Words. It's not part of our culture. Yeah. 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 But again, if, if if you didn't know it, then you wouldn't have to look into it. Oh, it's 2,000 cubits. I wonder how they figured that out. Oh, it's because they lived in a culture where you, A, didn't want to live too far from anybody else for security reasons. B, you want to be close to everything for Shabbat reasons because of this exact thing. So then you start to really kind of understand how the people thought and acted and, and, and operated back then. And then you got another problem. How much is a cubit? <laughs> yeah, how, yeah, how long is a cubit? So I remember Joseph Good said one time that not uh, there wasn't one single cubit, but something like there was like different cubits for different things, you know. Yeah. So it depended on I think on the right. context. Yeah. What? <laughs> that just, just, that just makes it more yeah, it's confusing, right? What? Like, like there's one cubit for this thing, and then a different what measurement cubit. cubit? cubit? So roughly, so roughly a a cubit roughly translates to one point five feet. Yeah. So a foot and a half. Because I know That's he was what I'm talking saying. about. So to change the internet, it could be lying. Right? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm checking again. Like a little side fact. Like I remember he was saying that it would be like the arm length from your elbow to the tip of your finger, something like that. Yeah. But not everybody has the same length of arms, you know. Like <laughs> me compared to Shaquille O'Neal, that's like two different. What about dwarfism? It doesn't it not work. The same. It's going off of Moses' arm to his fingertip. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah, just, they have a they picture of his it, arm. His, his fingers were crazy long. They're up to here, and his arm is huge. They didn't say that part. <laughs> so yeah, there's a lot of things that you have to study. It's not that simple, you know. Oh, yeah. and that's what's right. cool about the Bible is that it's there's a lot of things that you can learn about, and it never stops. Yeah, no, exactly. Never does. Yeah. But um, oh, let's see. I feel like you know, kind of getting into traditions that were kept in the New Testament kind of opens up this whole other world. You know, it's kind of like, oh well, that was that was a very different world they were living in back then. It's like I, I kind of want to learn more about that. It was more yeah, exactly. complex than what we think it is. You know. Yeah. Because yeah. I think when you just read yeah, it for it's... face value, it's very simple. But then you start seeing the different aspects, like you know, like they were keeping this tradition here. They were doing these things on the side. Like, for example, um, it's not really about traditions, but when Paul took the, I don't, was it Gentiles for the Nazarite vow? The Gentiles? No, I think it was just normal people I for the Nazarite normal people, vow. Yeah. I don't I like, know. Or like Judeans. Yeah, he, he probably, took the Judeans yeah. for the Nazarite vow. Uh, a lot of Christians, they overlook that. But to do the Nazarite vow, you would have to go to the temple. You had to offer, you know, an offering that would well, require thing, a sacrifice. But you bring that up, but even bring that up, it's important because Paul addressed those particular people and almost, almost, uh, almost scolded them. Like you should have, you should be doing the Nazarite vow. There's no reason why you shouldn't be doing that. And the reason why he was thinking those that particular group was because they were they had confirmed that they were Judeans. They had, they could trace their lineage, and they decided to not do that Nazarite vow to not go down. Because you notice that Paul doesn't do that to everyone he meets. Back then. Yeah. He doesn't just scold them like you need to go do a Nazarite vow. He doesn't do that to every single person he meets. Right? Yeah. It like when when you look into okay, so why is he addressing them differently than than, than other people? Like okay, so why is he telling them to do Nazarite vow, and why is he doing this? When you ask these questions and learn these things, now it makes more sense of okay, so they were here, trace your lineage back to here, but why didn't they? Why didn't they do it then? But you yeah. start asking you why the why the why the why. But the the big question is that you know, if Paul's doing that, but he's against it, you know, there's a contradiction right there. And, oh, yeah, and that can we actually pull up that section and read the beginning of where they yes, they yes. asked Paul to pay for the the uh, these people's Nazarite vows because yeah it they they say that the people are making this very interesting p charge against Paul and Paul's and what they say for Paul to do in order to refute this charge is to pay for these people's Nazarite vows but mm -hmm. the charge wasn't just that he was breaking the written Torah. Um, I'm trying to find the verse. 
Uh, looks like it's going to be Acts 21, 23 through 24, I believe. I'm looking through it now. Okay. We're going to see. We're going to see if I'm right. We're going to see if the internet has betrayed me once again. Let's see. Yeah, I think it's, yeah. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them. And pay their expenses that they may shave their heads. And that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing. But that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. Can we start in verse 20? Uh, yes. See. Uh, and when they heard it, they began glorifying God. And they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who, who have believed. And they are all zealous for the law, for the Torah. And they have been told about you, that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to, for, to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children, nor walk in the accord. Walk according to the customs. Yeah, right what there. What then is uh, it to be done? Yeah. Yeah. That, that or, last or you, yeah, or walk according to the customs. You can keep reading after that, but that was kind of, I think we already read it. Um, yeah, we did. A bit. Yeah, so it's like, what then? The assembly must certainly meet, but they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what yeah. we tell you. If four men have taken a vow, take them, purify them. So, but it's like, they're being told that he's not walking according to Moses. He's not mm -hmm. walking according to the laws of circumcision or the customs. And so it's like, okay, well, what are the customs? Exactly. Like, are these exactly yeah. Traditions of the Jewish people. Why are they accusing him? What is the issue? What is he breaking? What is he doing wrong? Yeah. Why does he then go with these men to purify himself along with them later on in, in the, um, in, in the chapter? Like why, like why, why is this such a case for Paul? Right. When you start asking these questions, it's just to kind of bring everything into scope. And it's like a big deal, you know? It's like you're, te you're teaching against like Moses and the customs of our people. And, mm -hmm. and, so, and so it's like, so here's what we'll, you can do to show these people that that's not the case. And Paul didn't say yeah. like, okay, I shall defend my position on keeping the written Torah and not the customs. Yeah. Like he doesn't say like, I'm not going to defend myself against the charge that I break the customs of our people. But he's like, no, it's like, okay, like, hey, like, what can I do? to uh, show everyone that I, I'm still teaching uh, according to Moses and circumcision and the customs of our people. Like, it's all like, I'm, I'm for it all, you know? Yeah. So yeah. it wasn't a bad thing for him. Yeah. The I, I think that's the, the big takeaway that people should take from this podcast is that clearly it shows you that not all customs or traditions, Yeshua or Paul, uh, you know, they weren't they weren't against all of them they had issues with some of them because of how they were applying them you know because for example washing your hands like we said before it's good to wash your hands i hope you guys wash your hands before i shake your hands guys <laughs> it's <such> um, <laughs> yeah i mean like i hope you guys wash your hands but if i you know if i don't wash my hands i'm not breaking god's commandments you know it, it would be disgusting, but I wouldn't be breaking God's commandments. The problem was that they were putting them, you know, equally. Like, the laws that I created are right there with God's laws. And sometimes they would see it as, like, above. Uh, and that's the big problem. Because then you start making people sinners when they're not sinners. And then you start, you know, ostracizing people. Uh, and you start creating these issues that really don't need to be there. Because you're creating these bigger problems. Um, and I think that's why Yeshua, he came back at that time, or he came that time, uh, to fix some of those issues, those social issues. Um, mm -hmm. Because uh, we'll talk about this probably like in another podcast, but there's also the concept of honor and shame. So yeah. uh, like a lot of the Pharisees and, and the Jews, they, they started, you know, doing things not because it was good in the eyes of God, but good in the eyes of men. And, you know, Yeshua makes some references like, you know, praying in public so everybody can see them um, and worrying more about the outside than rather than the inside. Uh, and that's why, you know, Yeshua, he was also paraphrasing like what he said uh, is to worry more about what God thinks about you rather than what men think, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and that t a lot of things tie in together in the New Testament, like. What we talk about in this podcast is like one portion of like the pie, and then we start talking about honor and shame. That's like another portion of the pie. A lot of it like intertwines. So, and that's the cool part that I like about it—that everything mixes. 
Uh, so you can't just talk about one thing without talking about the other. And we'll get into those things. Yeah. Hey, exactly. but uh, going off of what you were just talking about, talking about uh, the hand washing and um, making certain traditions, like in the, like making them equal to the law of God, uh, I think that's a really good segue into talking about what traditions did Yeshua seemingly have a problem with? Um, like what, where do, like in the New Testament, uh, do we see some traditions uh, being talked about in a negative way as opposed to traditions that he did keep? You know, and uh, mm-hmm. the hand washing is one of those. Or it mentions like the washing of the hands and vessels. Mm-hmm. Uh, does someone want to like bring up one of those passages and read it? Like Matthew 15, Luke 11, Mark 7. Uh, because I think Matthew fifteen is about the washing of hands, right? That's yeah. What I'm saying. But uh, and, uh, real quick, it's not one of those verses, but there's this time where Yeshua references that the Pharisees, you know, I'm paraphrasing these verses, but he talks about how you know they don't honor their their mother and their father, and it's about how they were taking tithes and putting them towards the the synagogues. Uh, rather than trying to help their own, you know, parents that were elderly and in need. And I think that, mm-hmm. I don't know if that would be considered a tradition or a concept, but I think that kind of ties in with how they were putting things that were not as important versus things that were more weightier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. It's almost just like, oh, I can, I'll dedicate this to the temple. And by doing, by dedicating it to the temple, I absolve myself from use, from any sense of having to use it to help my parents. Yeah, all my responsibilities yeah. are gone. Right. Which is and it's just like, okay, it's good to dedicate it's things to the temple, like if you want, if that's on your heart to do that. But, I mean, you've got your personal responsibility to take care of your parents if they're in need, to honor your father and your mother. And that's the ironic part of everything is that you're worrying about somebody not washing their hands, but at the same time, you're not taking care of your parents. So it's like, obviously, there's a disconnect like you know going on in the brain um so let me see matthew 15 verse yeah one, got it. verse two yeah i think that's where it, it talks about it mm-hmm. somebody right, i'm gonna go go yeah go let me know do it uh do you want me to just read two or read the part of the mother and father as well i think it's just um, verse two because in verse three it goes into exactly Okay, yeah, yeah. Just go ahead and continue. You can just start in verse 1 if you want to. Okay. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law of Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. And Yeshua replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that, that one might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God. They are not to honor their father or mother with it. Those you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their, their teachings are merely human rules. You know what you want? Because it gets pretty intense. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to keep going, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I like where this is going. Yeshua called to the crowd. Yeshua called the crowd to him and said, "Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth that is what defiles them." Then the disciples came to him and asked, "Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this?" He replied, "Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them; they are blind guides. If they blind, if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit." Savage. Yeah, I do. <laughs> and it said, Peter said, explain the parable to us. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still so dull, Yeshua asked him. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from their heart and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. Okay, so this is like, there's like a lot of really good stuff in here. And a it's, lot of good stuff in there. Yeah, and like, you know, Christians like to like 
like just hone in on this verse and be like, see, like it's not what goes into a person that defiles them. It's what goes out. I think you go show anymore. And, and then sometimes yeah. it adds afterwards, and then it says, "Thus Jesus declared all foods clean." In in parentheses, like right afterwards, <laughs> it's just like. But like at the very yeah, end, he says, "Yeah." If he he just ties it back into washing the hands. I don't know how he can misconstrue that to be like, "Oh, yeah. I, I don't, I, I can't work now. It's fine." <laughs> and the thing is, is so like, convenient. So, convenient. so we do see hand washing mentioned in the Torah. It's not specifically in the context of like washing your hands before you eat. Uh, uh, one one section where we see this talked about of like like a context where hand washing is like a legitimate thing in the Torah. Like one section is where the 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 priests will wash their hands before and their feet before they minister at the altar. Um, but another section is in Leviticus 15. Um, I can try pulling that up real quick. And this is like in a section, it has to do with bodily discharges, um, not, you, you know, just things that happen in life. Right. And right. Um, yeah, so in Leviticus 15, verse 11, it says, uh, anyone whom the one with a discharge touches without having rinsed his hands in water shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and may be unclean until evening. Uh, and an earthen what? earthenware vessel that the one with a discharge touches shall be broken and every vessel of wood shall be rinsed in water. Okay. So you can't rinse vessels of wood and water in certain contexts, but, um, okay. But this is talking about like a person who has some type of bodily discharge. Um, you know, he himself, before he goes and touches someone, like he's got to wash his hands. That shows that, um, hands being washed or unwashed in certain contexts, um, they can, that can determine whether or not ritual impurity is passed on to someone or something else. Mm -hmm. um, and so hand washing for the sake of ritual purity is a legitimate thing. I believe there's one more verse that talks about this and it's in numbers 31. Uh, okay. And so this is actually talking about, okay, this isn't hand washing, but it's the washing of vessels. Um, and so this is, I'll start in verse 21. So that, then El Eliezer the priest said to the men in the army who had gone to battle, this is the statute of the law that the Lord has commanded Moses. Only the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, the tin, the lead, everything that can stand the fire, you shall pass through the fire and it shall be clean. Nevertheless, it shall also be purified with the water for impurity. And whatever cannot stand the fire, you shall pass through the water. Uh, you must wash your clothes on the seventh day and you shall be clean. Afterward, you may come into the camp. And this is, like in the context of like they were in a battle, going out to war, um, and then the rites of ritual purity on the way back in and through the certain spoils of war, like for certain metals, for certain vessels that were of metal. It's like, okay, like washing, uh, it, washing vessels is a legitimate thing. Um, and it might not have necessarily gone into this in Matthew 15, but in other sections where it talks about ritual purity or the washing of hands where she was talking to the Pharisees about the washing of hands. It does mention like the, the washing of vessels as well. Uh, and so that's why that's relevant. So it's like hand washing and washing ve vessels. They are like they, that tradition is rooted in the Torah, but they'd kind of taken it up a notch. Yeah. Right. They're saying like, okay, like if you just don't eat with washed hands before you eat bread whatsoever, it's like, then you've passed on some certain type of impurity uh, or like that bread may have had some type of impurity or you may have had impurity on your hands and then like you're defiling yourself by eating that bread. So it's like, okay, mm -hmm. well, it's like we went from someone with a discharge, uh, maybe it's like some legitimate known impurity to like some very minor impurity that's being talked about in the second temple period. That's like, well, we've like really raised the bar. Yeah. Right. From like like a sanitation issue to you're going to hell if you don't wash your hands. Anymore. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, that's kind of where it jumped from there. Yeah, it's a big jump, and it so was a huge and, jump. and Yeshua is just like whoa, 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 guys, like calm down, chillax, bro. Like, like, yeah, um, and he gets on to him, and it's like you know, washing your hands. The tradition is rooted in the Torah, and there may have been like it may have kept you aware of certain things, but in the end of the day. It's a tradition that it's not a big deal in the end of the day, and you're really not breaking. 
like like the tour isn't going to fall apart if you don't yeah. wash your hands before you eat bread. Yeah, it's not a matter of salvation. It's really not. Right. It's a matter of obedience. Yeah. And so, but what these people were doing, you know, if they just kind of like went about their business and they were washing their hands, they were being cool, you know, like I'm cool with me, I'm cool with you, um, you're cool with me, I'm cool with you. Um, like that probably would have been one thing, but the Pharisees, they went up to Yeshua and said, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? Or they're not washing their hands when they eat. Yeah, they made it into they, like another, like, whoa. Another extreme level. Easy, bro. You just, you just like step on me like this in, in front of everybody in this whole crowd. Like, whoa, relax, man. Now, that was the... <laughs> That was the verse that I was talking about that he mentions that, you know, that about their their mothers and their fathers, you know, like him time and like, you know, it's yeah, kinda hypocritical that you guys are dogging on me because I don't wash my hands. But you don't even take like, care of your mom and your daddy. Like what's up with that? That's a good point, because like he just he doesn't even address washing the hands until the end. He's just like, Oh really? Well, at least I'm not the one that leave, like leaves my mom and dad high and dry. <laughs> so, it's like he was waiting for it. He was like, Oh, cool. Me, and the let's crowd the notes. Went, this is what we're doing. All right. And just like a like a quick fact, like about like because we mentioned honor and shame. Like the thing about honor and shame is that anything done in public, like the people will give you the honor, or they will also shame you. So the fact that he did that in front yeah, of everybody, yeah. like he publicly shamed them, and that's why they would get so upset because in front yeah. of everybody. He if you would, notice, a lot of the exchange between Yeshua and the Pharisees was always out in broad daylight in public. If you notice that, a lot of it was always in front of everybody. Like he. You're, you're proving that they're wrong in front of everybody. So now we're losing faith in the people of, of, of you know of this of this certain council of Pharisees, and now it's kind of exposing them in front of everybody, and it's kind of giving that public shame, like you're saying. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, do you want us to read uh, Luke 11? Because I think it's kind of the same scenario, but he like goes into a different like. Uh, yeah, go area. for it. Here, I, I got it. So I'm uh, I'm gonna read it from here. I think I'm going to start at 37. And as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and sat down to eat. When the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. Then the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees, make the outside of the cup and dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Mm -hmm. Foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But rather give alms of such things as you have, then indeed all things are clean to you. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are all like grace which are not seen, and the men who walk over them are not aware of them. Then one of the lawyers answered and said to him, Teacher, by saying these things, you reproach us also. And he said, Woe to you also, lawyers, for you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and your fathers kill them. In fact, you bear witness that you approve the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute. That the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge you did not enter in yourselves, and those who were entering in you hindered. And as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something he might say that they might accuse him. That's basically the, the whole chapter. Anyway. Yeah. That's a big chunk. There you go. But he said a lot of things. Yeah, he did. There's a lot of good stuff there. Yeah. And this, um, it's like this... a whole episode of the podcast from that one chat. We could break all that down. Wanted to. Yeah. No, we're really good. We're really good. Yeah. Um, and this goes back to, People were astonished that he didn't first wash like, before whoa. dinner. You know, <laughs> just whoa! <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's so his his rebuke of them. Oh, it just gets right down to the core. He's like, and and he plays off of this um, this Second Temple period uh, purity ritual language, 
right? He goes on to say, now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. Um, exactly. It's like you fools did not he who made the outside make the inside also. And it's like, you're pretending to be one thing on the outside. You're pretending to be pious through all of your rituals and your traditions. You know, it's not to say that they, the rituals themselves are inherently wrong. But the thing is, is that like what looks beautiful on the outside, it's, it's like on the inside is dead. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You can't, you can't just, you can't just have, you can't just have the purity laws and that's it. Like that, there, that needs to be like the Torah needs to supersede all of that. Because if you if you're trying to look holy and pure and everything, and, but not serving the reasons why you're trying to be pure, then you're just you're just putting on a show. I mean, you and think about really it, it. It's kind of like the the beginning of Isaiah, like chapter one, where he talks about how you know they're doing uh, like the Sabbaths, the feasts, and new moons, and all these things, but they're not keeping the heart of the Torah, like helping the widows, the yeah, needy, exactly. the orphan. Yeah. And even though right now they're not. The way committing adultery that. and you know following other gods they're still you know missing the point you know they're missing the mark of keeping the heart yeah. of the Torah. they are literally missing the forest for the trees they're staring at this one thing to try to get it and they're missing everything else around them on that one exactly mm -hmm. it's the same thing that we do so <laughs> right oh well, yeah the um but you know what he, he also goes on to say and a lot of this by the way is repeated uh, in mm -hmm. Matthew chapter 23. And I think it'd be like worthwhile going there in just a second as well. But he also mentions, he's like, um, uh, in verse 42, Luke um, 11, 42, I believe is where we are. Yeah. Uh, and he says, but woe to you Pharisees, for you tie the mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. And, you know, he's getting on to all these like little minute details of traditions that they're doing of the, all these, they're going kind of beyond the letter of the law to tithe all these nice, fancy things. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. He even goes on to say, these you ought to have done without neglecting the others being justice and the love of God. You know, there's nothing wrong with keeping these traditions. Yeah. But the thing is, is like what, you're doing it's like what are they seeking to accomplish by keeping the traditions in this case are they seeking to draw close to god and to help bring others closer to god or are they doing it to look big to look fancy uh, to right. put, on, to a put show. on a show yeah yeah, yeah. and you know i mean i've, I've got matthew 23 23 pulled up if you want to read it read it read it yeah go ahead um uh, well i think johnny you're, you're gonna say something right well no i was gonna say that um that uh I'm sorry. That's my baby. Uh, uh, I was going to oh, say that. This I that you can, you can go. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is this is becoming a disaster. What are we doing? No, <laughs> say the thing first. Then I'm going to read the thing. That's how we're going to do this. Yeah. Well, I was going to say that I think this applies today because you know in Hebrew roots, I don't think people are doing traditions to look good. But I think the problem is that they're focusing too much on the tradition part. Um, yeah. Uh, and not worrying about what's really important in the Torah, like, you know, exactly. the fellowshipping and, you know, helping those in need and things like that. If we would focus more on that part, I think we would come together more as a group than separate based on what tradition this person keeps. Because sometimes I feel like Absolutely. people react like the Pharisees, like, what? oh, you know, you don't you don't wash your hands uh, in the Kiddush and things like that, or you don't do this. I I, with you. Yeah. yeah, I'm not going to fellowship. You're because, a heretic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In a way, it's like the Hebrew roots movement in many circles has be become a movement of what I'm not. You know, well, yeah. I'm not this. Mm -hmm. I don't do that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, what are like, you? Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. Like, it's become so a movement okay. of I'm not like the church, but exactly. I'm also not like your congregation or your congregation either. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So we know we have this one list. So then what are you now? Can we, can we get to that part? <laughs> So what? Uh, really because what, John, what Jonathan was saying is, I think sometimes, and I don't blame anybody in particular. I think it just makes you to easy to look the part than to actually be the part. So you mm -hmm. focus on, well, I want him to think that I'm doing this one thing because I look like I'm doing this one thing, rather than hey, maybe if I do, maybe I don't have a thousand dollars to give to the to the uh, widow, but maybe I'll start with hey, maybe she needs milk this week. 
and little things like that, we become that person rather mm-hmm. than, hey, I'm gonna take a picture. I just gave this homeless man two dollars, <laughs> exactly. and I, I, I look like I'm good. <laughs> and, you know, it doesn't even have to be somebody outside in the street. It could be somebody in your congregation. If there's somebody in your congregation needs yeah. help, you show up that person. Simple as that, dude. Like he's struggling. He's on his last quarter tank of gas. He needs to get, dude. Here's five dollars. Fill up. Or here's ten dollars. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's it's not the, it's not really on the big. Not crazy deal. stuff, yeah. yeah. So Matthew twenty three twenty three. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you, oh sorry, hypocrites! For you, for you, tithe mint and dill and cumin, and neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. There you go. So and what we just said. What we yeah. just said. Okay. Well, that's the text backing up. What we say, and it's confirmed. <laughs> no, you know, <laughs> reading about. it like within the context of Matthew twenty-three, um, mm-hmm. I, I think honestly between like Matthew twenty-three and Luke eleven, I think like Matthew twenty-three like gets even heavier uh, yeah. because this is Yeshua's big rebuke of the Pharisees. Like he goes into like mm-hmm. thing after thing after thing, um, the seven woes to the scribes and Pharisees. And, you know, a lot of people be like, mm, Yeshua versus them Pharisees, like Pharisees can just like, you know, it's like, like, get with it. Uh, the Pharisees, like, he's just like, oh, he just bashed them. And the Pharisees were bad and they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. And, um, but the thing is like, okay, we can look at it like that. We can be like, okay, yeah, Yeshua just hated those Pharisees. Or can we look at them as legitimate criticisms that he had of them? And what if they were to take those criticisms and, um, and look inward at themselves, be introspective and be like, okay, like what he's saying is true. How can this help make us better teachers? How can this help make us better leaders? You know, if we actually are applying the things that Yeshua is saying, um, but what I, I was talking to a friend of mine uh, this past week on Matthew 23. And he, he mentioned to me, he's like, he's like, Russell, this is my friend, Kyle, like shout out to my friend, Kyle. Um, Guy's got a lot going for him. He's going to be an amazing teacher one day. Just dude's Good like crazy intelligent. Maybe we can have him like on the podcast sometime. Like I, I met him last year, right? How's that? I mean, you're talking about Kyle from last year, right? Last Revive? Yeah. Was with, that's, okay. Yeah. What's up, Kyle? If you're watching. Don't, you. <laughs> man. Johnny, don't, don't dox him. For, just chill. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, like he's an awesome guy. But he pointed out to me, he's like, he's like, Russell, if we applied all of these rebukes uh, to the scribes and Pharisees, like to the Hebrew Roots movement, if we applied it to ourselves, like how could that help make us better teachers and leaders and yep. lights in the world? Make a big you know, difference. Because, oh, yeah. Like for sure. Yeah, he'd make a difference. Um, he was pointing out to me, um, like just starting off in the very beginning, like uh, in verse one, it's like, then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their right. deeds to be seen by others. For they make their phylacteries broad, the tefillin, and their fringes long, seat seat. They love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. Mm. Um, but you are not to be called rabbi for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. And, and so on and so forth. He goes more into the telling his disciples how, how and what they should do. But this big opening critique of the Pharisees, it's like, like this is some heavy stuff. And, but yeah. he starts, and it's like this very, um, this polemical argument um i think there's a there's a technical term for this but he he starts it off and he's like they sit on moses's seat so do and observe what they tell you but not the works they do mm-hmm. and so it kind of goes like mm-hmm. okay they are sitting on moses's seat like the whole idea of rabbinic authority the idea that it all can be traced back to moses in one way or another or in like yeah. this Moses seat whatever they were doing there is probably where the leaders in the synagogue sat to teach the people yeah. whether that was just the written Torah, or whether they were also teaching them, you know, the traditions as well. Probably were teaching mm-hmm. traditions while they sat down teaching, because that just yeah. by nature is what a leader would do. Um, he's going to yeah. uh, take everything, not just focus on like well, the written word says, especially whenever mm-hmm. someone might be standing up to read. But like, I don't know that for sure. No one mm-hmm. really knows that Moses' seat, um, so that's not to be like knocking anyone that right. says one or the think, other. Well, 
I think really what, what he's saying is, is the fair cycle movement at the time, they, yeah, they're doing a lot of things, obviously doing, they got eight woes on here. They're doing a lot of things wrong, but at the same time, they are a legitimate, they, they have been a legitimized governing body that needs to be respected. Yeah, for Even sure. though they're doing all these things, they're still appointed and they are legitimized. So we have, we have to do, it's still the law. Yeah. Like, hey, if we could take that one, one piece of advice and apply it to our movement today, like if we had yeah, like right, yeah. authority and like everyone was just trying to like tear everyone else down, disrespecting mm-hmm. like the movement would be just, Russ I think that would there. be like, scary. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but the thing is, is he goes on to say, for they preach, but do not practice. It's like they preach, but do not practice. Do what they tell you, but not what they do. Yeah. Um, they're telling you how to live. You should be like, they are the ones that can read the Torah. Like they were probably the literate people. Or as not everyone back then could read. And so they could read the Torah. They could tell you how to apply it to your life, which involved tradition. But it's like, but at the same time, like, what are they doing exactly? And he says, they tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. It's like, okay, it's like you could take that to mean like they're making all these big traditions. But at the same time, it says, but they're not willing to move them with their finger. But the thing is, is that Mm -hmm. like, so basically, the way that my friend explained this to me, Kyle, he made a really good point. It's like, it seems not to be a polemic against tradition itself, but it seems to be a polemic against how the leadership is handling themselves, like, and how the leadership, mm-hmm. there's a big disconnect between the leadership and the lay people. Like, yeah. are you making this walk, keeping Torah easy for your brother? Are you kind of like, mm-hmm. are you kind of going down to their level, meeting them where they're at? And then maybe laying a light burden on them or better yet, mm. help them carry the burden instead of not being willing to move it with your finger, like help them carry that burden. You know, it's like, this is, it puts out this idea. They're laying the burdens on the people's shoulders, but they don't want to have anything yeah. to do with it. It's like, why aren't they it's getting a lot of, yeah. yeah, It's a lot of base hypocrisy. That's, that's the big issue. It's a lot of base hypocrisy in, in the movement of the time. Right. Well, and so it's, and he talks about these things that are traditions. Mm-hmm. And he, like, all throughout this discourse, he's like, even the phylacteries, the, the tefillin, some people would say that's a literal commandment. There are others that would argue that that's kind of like they've taken a phrase and they've made it into a tradition that's like, like there, there's arguments both ways to say that tefillin are more traditional than they are literal commandment. Or, it, like, was it ever meant to be, you know, like binding them as a sign on your hand and frontless between your eyes? Was that ever meant to be taken mm-hmm. literal or is it? mainly figurative and then was it hyper literalized like i can see the arguments going both ways but for those that want to say oh that's tradition it's like okay like he just he puts to fill in the phylacteries right up there with seat seat and we know that is a commandment yeah. like he doesn't have a problem with it he's just saying like yeah. what's your intention behind doing that you know mm-hmm. like what's your intention behind like being all pompous and pious and keeping all these traditions mm-hmm. uh and making a big deal of, of everything. And it's like, and not even just the traditions, but it's like Torah in general. Like they're making the Torah into a heavy burden for the people. Yeah. They're like all of it. Exactly. Yeah, it's yeah, not good. Right. Right. It's, it's sad. Yeah. But here's the thing. How many of us and how, like, how many people, like maybe have you seen in the Hebrew Roots movement that they make Torah a hard thing for people? Yeah, like it's yeah. not good enough until you're doing this. Exactly. Doing I, this. See, I see a lot of youth. I've seen a lot of youth of the past past 10, 15 years that they, they see the Torah as a burden because of the way that they've been raised in it, not as a lifestyle or as an addition to your life, but as the life, this is it. This, the Torah is everything. Like any problem you have that's a modern issue, just apply some, uh, some verse that doesn't have the same context to it. And now it becomes this weighty matter on you forever. And that's why uh, sadly a lot, a lot of youth, when they get to you know, adult age, they break away and they go do their own thing. Yeah. And they don't want nothing to do with it, and it's it's just sad that that the the mindset gets a little bit twisted. Well, it's a bit of a misunderstanding, being being a little overzealous, and then it reverberates down the road to this point. And that's wow. it's probably the that's that's probably one of the bigger issues that I've, I've seen. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Yeah. And like, what about yeah. people? It's like, oh, I'm, I walk up in the congregation, everything. It's like, where's your seat seat, man? Like, where's your seat seat? Like, you're gonna walk into a Hebrew roots congregation, you're not wearing seat seat. Like, well, what are you talking about? Like, this is my first day. I don't know what you're talking about. You ain't wearing the tassels. You're not like part of the gang, bro. <laughs> like, like you're really, you're not really <laughs> doing it. The tassel game. Yeah. <laughs> but say, yeah, it's you true though. Like five years ago, what were you to say anything? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, 
It's like, oh, I wear my talit on Shabbat. You know? Like, where's your talit? It's like, I, I don't know what that is, dude. It's like, well, you gotta, you gotta get a talit. I mean, the big problem is chill. like... I got a jersey, bro. Chill. We're not on Alex. Yeah. The big problem that you see, though, is that like a lot of people, they see a new tradition and they start it out without really like doing some research or anything like that. Yeah. But not only do they, for it. yeah, they start doing that the the new tradition that they just learned, and then they become zealous for it, and then they start you know bickering with other people like, yo, like how come you're not keeping this tradition? You know, I, I learned about <laughs> you're doing it, it so wrong. you gotta keep it. Yeah, you know. <laughs> doing this thing I learned about last week, doing it wrong. <laughs> it's like, and I think people need to slow down. Like, it's good to keep traditions, but you know, uh, like Russell said, what's your intention behind keeping the tradition? Because there's a bunch of traditions that you can keep, but it's going to get to the point where it just becomes com complicated. Like, how far yeah. are you going to go? And, and what is the purpose of you keeping those traditions? Because you know? some people, um, not everybody, is going to do it for show. And other people, they want to do it because they love God and they love the, what the tradition represents. You know, like us and the Kiddush. The Kiddush is not found in the Torah, but it's a tradition that we keep because it helps us structure how we keep the Shabbat. Because if you ask... If you ask... Uh, a regular person that just started, how do you keep the Shabbat? He's not going to really know. He's not going to know what to yeah. follow. I think bread and wine, that's it. Bread, wine, and candles, yeah. I guess. That's bread, it, wine, right? candles, and then I go to bed at like 8 p.m. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I read the Bible and, and then I go to bed at 8 p.m. That's it. Yeah, the Kiddush helps out a lot. So like, those, those, those are the traditions that I see that they add in a good way and it helps bring structure. And then, you know, I think those that that's the intention that you have to find when you see a tradition. Now, I'm doing this because for me, it honors God in a good way, not just so you know. Oh, look at me, you know, look what I'm doing yeah. today. Yeah. Yeah, become a fan. You guys are going to go to hell because I'm doing this better than you. Oh yeah. Look at me, I'm Jewish now. <laughs> look at me, look at me, and all my Jewiness. Yeah, look at me. That's right. Yeah, so said, yeah I think I'm part of the twelve tribe. I think. <laughs> part of the good one. <laughs> Which one? Is there one that, that, that the kings are from? I'm, I'm I'm part of that one. You're not though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'll yeah. I'm not from Ruben. Not, I'm not from Ruben. I'm not Ruben. I, I'm, I'm not from Ruben. Ruben. I'm not from Ephraim. I'm not. I'm 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 from I'm from the other one. I'm from the other one. Dan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Dan. Sure. So um, so there's something else that Yeshua said here, and I think this can all be tied into. You know, what's really interesting to me here is that Yeshua, he, he lumps everything together and how he's rebuking the scribes and the Pharisees. He's not just saying, you're tying traditions on people's shoulders, but he's saying the whole deal. Like, everything you're teaching these people, like the Torah, like, you're sitting in Moses' seat, you know, whether you're teaching from the written Torah, the, um, the tradition, you know, everything, you're probably going to be saying it there. It's like everything that you're teaching these people, Torah, tradition, everything, you're making it into a burden. And he goes on in the verse 13 and says, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would Ouch. enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you travel across the sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. It's like, Damn. that's a Woo! massive insult. Like, yeah. Yeah. Is it, is it, right? is he like backhanded yeah. them. Like. But think about and it. Think about it's it. like for the person just crying. <laughs> <laughs> but think about it like this. If your whole mentality is to go around to people and pointing out saying like, well, you're not doing this. Like, you're not keeping this tradition. You're not keeping this commandment yet. You know, like this might be your first day in the congregation, but like you haven't yeah, you stopped eating X, Y, and Z. You know, but think about it. Let's lump it all. Let's lump tradition and Torah keeping all together. Let's lump it together. Guess what, mm -hmm. what Yeshua is doing in this passage. The, the whole yeah. thing, tradition, Torah, all of it. He's just saying, like, look, you go across land and sea to make a proselyte, and whenever you make him one, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Like, yeah. your mentality towards Torah, towards keeping Torah, has gotten so messed up. It's like, you introduce you someone to it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, push them you, away. like, and if you don't push them away, it's like you're turning them into an even more obnoxious person than yourself. Yeah. And think about that. But it's like, how many people do we see like that in the Hebrew Roots movement mm -hmm. at large? You know, they're like, hey, man, like, you should come into this movement. Like, the, we're the true way. We're not like the, like, the God-forsaken um, system, like, yeah, the church, church system. The, yeah, we're, yeah, yeah so. we're not part of the church. But we then do. it's like, you take this other person out of, like, a church where maybe they're going and um, they're, 
you know, they're, they're tithing, but they're helping people out, you know, like, like they've dedicated some of their income towards helping the church community. Um, they're going and doing charity runs and soup kitchens and then yeah. like bring them into the Hebrew roots movement and they stop all of it, all of it. It's like, I'm not tithing ever again. You're not getting any of my money. Like how, like I'm, they stop doing the soup kitchens, the charity runs, um, and they just stop all of it. And then they start telling, like, beating people over the head with flat earth and uh, and how they're dressing. Oh, God. Oh, God. You know? Oh, no. but seriously. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Let's, it's let's sad, apply true. all of this to, like, let's apply it all yeah. to ourselves. Like, how many people in the Hebrew Roots movement will take someone will take someone out of a church where they're they're doing good and then make them mm -hmm. into twice a child of hell as themselves? Yeah, it's true. This is where, this is where Yeshua comes in and says, you hypocrite. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, exactly. So, so I guess the real big quest question here is, is it is tradition really bad or is it what we choose to do with it? Yeah, it's like anything else. It's the latter. Anything good in moderation is great. When you go Two way extremes. over board with it, it becomes yeah. a burden. It becomes bad. Yeah. And I think well, that can happen with tradition, or and it can even happen with the written commandments too. If you want to beat people over the head with it, and they're not ready yeah. yet, especially new people. You know, yeah, there's there's technically over 300 laws in the Torah, but if you try to master all of them, you'll you'll lose your mind and you won't have a life. So you ha you have to understand what what actually applies to you and what doesn't, like, like tradition. And so it's like kind of like hmm? at the very beginning of his rebuke, he says you're laying these heavy burdens on the people, but you don't want to lift it with your own finger. It's like okay, so. Maybe we can look at that ourselves today. And if we want to introduce people to Torah keeping, uh, we want to help introduce more commandments of the written Torah into their lives on terms of what they're eating, maybe the holidays, Shabbat. You know, are we going to dump it all on them like one big load to begin with? Or are we going to meet them where they're at? You know, are we going to be like, hey, like, like, you've been doing this for a while. Did you know about this commandment? Like, mm -hmm. did you know that you shouldn't be eating this as well? Or like, hey, there's the Shabbat, dude. Like, that's really cool, you know? I feel like that's one of those first things that everyone learned, but it's like, yeah. but it's like, hey, it's like a blessing. You get to proclaim the kingship of God through your rest, and then the person's exactly. like, oh, I didn't know that. That sounds really cool. And I so, know, right? bit, yeah, bit by bit in moderation. Yeah, yeah. they start opening yeah. up and asking questions and stuff like that. That's yeah. how it should so, start. Yeah. So we meet them where they're at. We help carry the burden mm. with them. We meet them at their level, and maybe the same thing with traditions. Like, hey, did you know this tradition, the kiddush, that this can really help? You uh, with your Shabbat observance and like making it meaningful for yourself. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Yeah. So I I don't know. Like, oh, yeah. how do you think that we can take all this talk of tradition in the New Testament, the the goods and some of the seemingly bads, and how how can we like make this? What can we make out of this for ourselves today? How can we find meaning in all of this? Well, I, I think a lot of it applies to us today personally, especially in our movement, mm -hmm. because you know. In our movement, you'll go to a lot of different places, and a lot of people keep different traditions. And it's okay. It's fine. But the problem right. is, is when you make that your identity, and like that's the line that you cannot cross. Like If you don't keep my tradition, yeah. mm -hmm. you can't hang out with me. Or I right. look down on you because you didn't keep my tradition. You know, That's the big issue yep. in the movement right now is that... I think, I think if we were going to go ahead and go through with what we feel i feel like we're gonna just kind of tread the same water and kind of give the same answers because we all we're in the same movement together we're in the same kind of community i feel I like this that. question <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. i mean i i am i don't know about you i i, I do all the holy things if you don't then i guess we're deleted <laughs> but <laughs> i really think that this question is a good place to kind of Rest kind on. of pause on this topic and maybe we'll pick it up again on another podcast because this might be a good chance for, for listeners to ruminate on it, how to marinate, think about it for themselves, and just kind of start to decipher what is what is positive tradition for their own walk at, at, at their own kind of stage. I agree. I agree. Yeah. So I guess this is where we, we close off, right? Yeah. Um, oh, actually, uh, I do want to say one last thing. The uh, on Acts twenty one with Paul sailing uh, and making the Nazarite vows. I got confused because in that chapter he talks about going uh, from Caesarea and a few other of the isles in, in the Greek region through Tyre and Cyprus. I got confused. I was thinking something else. So that's why I made those remarks about him talking down to certain people. I was thinking something else entirely. But there you go. Just to oh, clarify, see, I, I, I was <laughs> I on to... Paris, so I. 
Yeah, no, because I because I, I saw the guys looking at me. Was like, did am I thinking of the right story? I and you know what? I don't think I was. So I'm willing to admit when I'm wrong, I'm wrong. You know, it happens. So, I made a comment too that I need to clarify. Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> but uh, okay. So whenever you were saying like, who who was it that he was having like taken to a Nazarite vow? Was it was it the Gentile or was it Gentiles? So I was like, no, it was just normal people. And I was like, it's Judeans. Just to clarify, Gentiles are normal people too. <laughs> yeah, we're, all, we're all normal people. <laughs> just to people. clarify. <laughs> you, mean, you mean they're not aliens? Not, they're not aliens, man. We'll take them. But uh. <laughs> but yeah I, I guess we'll just close it off and you know we'll see everybody next time all right yeah, absolutely yeah thanks, right. thanks for watching guys thank you bye. Shalom, shalom shalom bye everybody